Um, we're going to be in Jonah chapter 4, if you like to turn there, Jonah chapter 4. Has it been two Wednesdays that we haven't ha had service because of snow? Does anybody know? I know last Wednesday was for sure. But it's good to be back uh, on a Wednesday night. And good to be able to uh, fellowship together. Good to see folks we haven't seen in a while. Have you all back, especially Scott. Good to see him. A lot of exciting things going on in his life right now. And maybe if you corner him, he might be able to uh, tell you a little bit about that. Uh, Jeremy came in, and before I forget to do this, I don't see Darren out there anywhere, and so let me just remind you that Amore is going to be on Saturday. That is uh, a meal that we're having. I, I guess, is it all right to say a romantic meal uh, that we're having? Husbands are supposed to bring wives, and boyfriends are supposed to bring girlfriends, and if you don't have anybody like me, you just come by yourself. Well, I have somebody, but you'll be gone. By yourself, you just uh, you come, but you have a good time. And there, there's no charge to it other than, uh, an, I, I, don't, I guess it's an offering. What are they doing? You just uh, give whatever you want to give. Donations. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for, donations. And that's going to go to, what is it going to, Laurie? Youth group camp. You're helping the kids get to camp if you want to be a part of that. And I'll try to re remember to, uh, to do that again at the end of the service, make you aware of it. Well, I've uh, preached through this, and these are the hardest messages to ever do. And any time you are uh, preaching through a book or preaching through a message and you get each point takes an entire night, that's what I've done. I preached these originally, all, all four chapters, uh, three and a half, four years ago, maybe two years ago. I'm not sure. It's been some time ago. And um, this last chapter, I don't think I'm going to be going to any of the other chapters, but this last chapter, chapter four, is where we're going to be at tonight. And I'm uh, dealing with it because it's, I think it's where we live at right now. That's where our church is at right now. Good things that are happening in people's lives. Uh, delighted to see that. Told Andrew when he came in tonight, he makes everybody's day when he walks into the church building. And we're just still rejoicing with him about his decision to receive Christ as a Savior and, and uh, others who are contemplating decisions. And that's a real blessing and great motivation to us also when you see those things. The title of this message is The Pouting Prophet's Poor Perspective. Uh, you know how I like to use those alliterations. And, and um, this, this matter of, of Jonah, he has a, a lousy attitude. That's what the bottom line is. He's got a lousy attitude that he has toward a lot of things in life. And I'm going to get to some of that. But I, I want you to stop and think about what really has fostered this book. Uh, really, if you start reading in Jonah chapter 1 and you read all the way through all four chapters, which is a good way to do that, you're going to find that a, a lot of good things had happened in Jonah's life. At least I think they were good things, and probably everybody else would think they were good things. For instance, an entire city, the city of Nineveh, was spared from the destruction that God was going to bring upon that entire city. Jonah was an evangelist in the greatest revival that's ever been in the history of the world. And one message that he preached, he had 120,000 people that were saved. That's astounding. There's never been anything even close to being anything like that. And, and then probably the most important thing of all is God was glorified. Numbers don't say it all. If uh, numbers make things right, then the Mormons are doing a really good job and they, they would be right, but they're not. And yet they have a lot of powerful numbers that suggest that they've done something very right. Maybe they have in a lot of ways, but not in, not in truth. And so uh, numbers aren't everything. And, and Jonah, as he looks at this, he's very, very disturbed, as I'm going to be showing you. And if you went through the entire book of Jonah, there's only four chapters there, you're going to find that one of those chapters is going to fit you right now in life. You might, for instance, be like in chapter 1, and you're running from God. God's been pursuing you. Uh, we were out uh, eating last night and, and uh, fellowshipping with the folks that we were with, and had a very gregarious uh, waitress that was waiting on us, and, and um, she was making a bunch of wisecracks about a lot of things, and I was thinking, how in the world are we going to work into to at least asking her to church? And, and um, she began to really share a lot of things. It really opened my eyes to a lot of things, and she was wanting a cat, and she was wanting a lot of different things she was asking about, and Bernie, and, and you got some cats to give away, I guess, or at least had a cat to give away. And she was wanting to, get the, wanting to get that cat. And she had lots of uh, difficulties that were going on in her life. And I said, well, you better talk to your husband first. She said, oh, this guy I'm living with is not my husband. Oh, okay. But it's all right. We're doing really good. She's sincere as she can be. We went on talking just a little bit. And, 
found out that she goes to church with her grandfather. He goes to a Baptist church outside of Berea. And as we were uh, talking together, it just I found myself sitting there, not really being amused, but sitting there and thinking to myself, this girl really thinks that everything is okay, when really what she's doing, she's running from God. But she knew a lot of things that, that really surprised me. Ask yourself that question right now. Are you running from God? Is God trying to bring something about in your life, and you find that you fit in chapter 1, you're running from God? Maybe you're just uh, coming back to God like Andrew has done. Andrew is from everything I understand, was raised in church, and he just found out that he wasn't really a Christian, and he's come back to God. And maybe there's people that are here tonight, probably are people that are here tonight, that you need to move on to chapter 2 and start coming back to God. And then there's a lot of others that find uh, the the other chapter that really meets the need in their life is the chapter, probably chapter 3, the joy of telling others about mercy and grace, and that's where we're really going to be at tonight. And here's what the real question is, because some of you I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know because you've told me that you're right in this particular narrow gap. And that narrow gap that we're talking about is that you're an individual who is kind of uh, caught up in the fog, so to speak, but you're an individual who's really given some thought to this. I wonder what would happen with my life if I got right with God. Wonder what would happen with my life if I got right with God? Now, each one of us need to ask that question because you're going to find that as we work our way through here, that, that question is really answered in a lot of neat ways. In this final chapter of Jonah, we're going to see his poor perspective. Let me give you the outline of this because we're really only going to focus on chapter 3. And uh, I'll give you some a little bit because there's a lot of people that are here tonight that haven't heard any of this. Here are the three points. Uh, Joe, will have them up on the screen for you. I think you got it. Joe, do you have them? I don't see you up there anyway. You do? Okay. Number one is the poor perspective of people. Jonah had a lousy perspective of people. And then there's the poor perspective of provision. God had really blessed him and given him what he needed, and he was uh, kind of ticked off about that when God decided to change a a few things. And the last one that we're going to get to tonight, but it's really an extremely important one, and that's this, that Jonah had a very poor perspective of forgiveness, pardon, a very poor perspective of pardon, forgiveness. He just didn't think certain people really should be forgiven for what they've done. That's right where he was at in his life, and and I'm going to show you some things about that. Now, let me take point one, the poor perspective of people. And I can summarize what I mean by that by just saying this to you. Here's the difference, and, and this really does clarify what his poor perspective, his poor view was of people. God loved the Ninevites. Now, the Ninevites were people that hated the Jews. Ninevites were people that were very ungodly in every way that you can possibly imagine. It's a really interesting study. In fact, I've done not a lot of reading, but just a little bit. And the little bit of reading that I did, the Ninevites were people that were, were just uh, the worst people of their day. Big, big city, 120,000 back in that day was enormous in one given city. And so that's, that's what God said. He said, listen, Jonah, I love the Ninevites. What he was saying is, I love sinners. The Ninevites are just representative of all sinners. And, and that takes you and I to remember that God loves the people that aren't just like us. You might not be a homosexual, but you need to know that God loves homosexuals. You may not be an individual who uh, is like a whole lot of other bad things we could say, but God loves them. And, and, in fact, it just comes to my mind, we can all probably right now in our own mind think of somebody that's a Ninevite, somebody that's really bad in their life. And we have a tendency to want to shove those people away and tell those people they haven't got any place in our life. And, and what he wants us to understand is that God loves Ninevites. He loves sinners. And here's the problem. And the problem really exists sometimes in our own lives, and you're the only one who can judge that. Even though God loved the Ninevites, Jonah hated the Ninevites. Hated them with a passion. And you're going to see that as I begin to read some scripture to you. In fact, let's, let's get started in that in verse 1 of Jonah chapter 4. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was very angry, very angry. Now, here's the question. What was Jonah angry about? All you got to do is just look back one page and look at chapter 3, the last verse of chapter 3, and you're going to see that, that when Jonah went and preached to the Ninevites to repent or God was going to come among them and destroy all of them, that what happened was everybody, everybody, as a result of his message, 
said, I want to be forgiven by God of my sin. I'm turning from my sin, and it's not going to be in my life anymore. And God heard their prayer, and God saw them turn to him in faith, and God decided that he would not destroy the people. And that's what ticked off, that's what ticked off Jonah. Now stop and think about what I'm saying. Jonah goes to him to preach to him. You remember a whale had to swallow him or some giant fish, whatever it was. It was prepared by God. And, and a, a fish has to swallow him to make him go to the Ninevites. He hated them so much, he just wanted God to destroy them. Don't give a chance. Kind of reminds me, I remember years ago, my dad was a, not a good man, but my dad was dying. Got a call from uh, a nurse in Drake Memorial Hospital that's still in Cincinnati on Galbraith Road. And when I got a call from this nurse, she said, if you want to see your dad alive, you better come because he's not going to live through the night. And so I did and um, called my sisters and I said, listen, I got a phone call from a nurse and believe it or not, I've heard from our dad. I haven't talked to him directly, but they say he's in the hospital. I'm going to go see him. Do you want to go with me? One of my sisters said, yes, I'm going to go with you. And the other sister, here's what she said to me. Don't go. Let him die and go to hell. And I said, i got to go. And she said, well, if you go, don't tell him about Jesus Christ. Just let him die and go to hell. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. Is there anybody in your life that you know that you would, you would really say that about? Let him die. Let him, that's exactly what Jonah is doing. He's displeased. He's angry that these people are responding to his preaching. We're going to see some really neat things about that that God wants us to understand. And here's the point that I want you to see throughout this message. God, rather than pouring out his judgment, wanted to give them mercy. I want you to hear that because that applies to you and everybody you know. God would rather give mercy than judgment. God always, no matter who it is, no matter what they've done, God always wants to give mercy, not judgment. Now, I feel the need here. Um, If it doesn't seem like it fits in, it's because you just don't know. But I feel the need here to express a little bit about that. There's a a real difference, because we're going to really be on forgiveness, but there's a real difference between forgiving somebody and being reconciled to somebody. Um, You can forgive someone and never have reconciliation in your life with that person again in your life. And that may very well be the will of God especially uh, divorcees that, that sometimes go through situations like that. You know, uh, I know that somewhere along the line, me and I think most of my sisters, if not all of them, um, we came to the place in our life where we were willing to forgive my dad. I was, at least. I know that for sure. But, but can I say to you, I never wanted him to move into our house again. I didn't want him to be there. Do you see the difference in this? I forgave him for what he did. The, the many terrible things that he did. But I didn't want him in my life. I didn't. Was I sinning to do that? I don't believe I was sinning to do that. I, in fact, frankly, I think that was all totally and completely of God. Now, I just wanted to touch on that because it's very important to understand that when we're, doing, when we're going to be dealing with forgiveness, you have to be released. You have to be released from a person. And the only way to be released from a person that's very sinful or perhaps has even hurt you in a very bad way is forgive them. You've got to forgive them. I know for some people that's a, that's a lifetime thing. Here's what Jonah was really angry about and what we, we need to really grasp ourselves. Jonah was angry because God was just being God. Now, if you don't understand that, I want you to look at this verse very carefully. Joel will have it up on the screen. Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2. And I want you to look at, particularly at that last phrase, the last phrases that are in that Uh, chapter because it really depicts exactly what we're talking about. This is God just being God. This is a characteristic of God that's always there. Doesn't matter whether it's Hitler that he's talking to or or whether it's Billy Graham that he's talking to. We could say this. Here's what it says. And Jonah prayed unto the Lord. He prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarshish. That's where he, God captured him, and put him in a whale's belly. For I knew that you are, here's what I want you to see, I knew that you are a gracious God, a merciful God, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. 
In other words, all he's saying is that when you're, you're dealing with evil, you're willing to turn away from the evil and the people that are evil. You're willing to turn away from it because God would always rather give mercy than judgment. Now that ought to be good news to you and to me. Because no matter what's been in our lives, no matter what is, is in our life now, God cries out to us, I want to forgive. I really want to do that for you. That, that ought to mean something to you because you can look at your life right now and think the worst things that have ever been in your life. And you can have this assurance. God is saying to you, I want to forgive you. I will forgive you if you'll turn to me. Some people, they have a view of God as a mean and angry God that's just waiting for someone to do something wrong so he can hurt them. And that is not the picture that the Bible gives of God at all. God's not like that. Now, to be sure, just to balance out this side, because the Bible has stuff to say about this, there's, there's going to be a judgment one day. God is going to bring judgment upon people that have never trusted his son as their savior, for sure. God's going to deal with sin one day. But God is telling us that right now he wants us to understand that he wants to give mercy to anybody that's willing to take that mercy. And I want you to, to see very clearly that what's going on here is this view that some people have that God is an angry God. You can understand why they would be certain, certain ways about them. But Jonah was not like that. Jonah had a biblical view. What there was of the Bible, he understood. Because it's very clear. We see right here, he tells us, he gives us a theological statement in verse 2. He says, I know the doctrine of God. I know that God is all of these things. These are his attributes. What are they again? That you're a gracious God. That is, you give things that people don't deserve. You're a merciful God. You withhold things that people do deserve, like God's judgment. And he goes on to say, and you're slow to anger. That means you're very, very patient. And, and you have great kindness, and, you, and you, you turn from evil. You will not let evil be about us in our life and help us to turn from it ourselves. That's really important for us to grasp because there are some people that they have a right view of God, but they still see things wrongly. I would venture to say that probably everybody in here is in my eyes comb our congregation, which I, I think all of you would say this, that you believe the Bible is the eternal word of God, and, and whether you're doing it or not, you're trying to live your life by the Bible, by what the Bible says. The Bible says something's wrong, then you believe that it's wrong. That young lady that was uh, talking to us, um, she, she began to share, and I said, you know, you, don't, you can get this corrected in your life. You don't have to just be living with a guy. And she said, well, I've been married before, and it, it just didn't work out. And I said, well, don't give up on marriage. That's like throwing the baby out with a wash. You know, you don't do that. You don't give up. Let's, here's the point I'm trying to make with this and taking a roundabout way to get there. You, you can come to a place in your life where you really do know your doctrine, but you have skewed the Scripture to meet what you want to believe, whether it's scriptural or not. And I'm going to tell you something. Every one of us have that propensity. I can do that and you can do that. We have a way of looking at our life, at, at whatever it may be in our life, and saying, well, the Bible says this, but maybe the Bible means this when it's crystal clear. You could read through those Ten Commandments and somebody said they're not ten suggestions. Well, what that really is talking about is you've got to look at this and realize that there, we take a literal translation of the Bible because that's what we're supposed to take and not a figurative translation. When he says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, he says, I don't want anything ahead of me in your life, nothing. Not your wife, not your kids, not your car, not your house. Not anything comes ahead of me. And we've all broken that first commandment. You could work your way all the way down through there, and you have a proper biblical understanding of what the Bible has to say. But our problem comes in. When our life doesn't match with what we claim we believe, sometimes what we do is we twist it. We skew it to make it be what we want it to be. She was trying to convince me that things were all right with her, even though she was living with a guy. He was a nice guy, but still living with him. Well, that's, that's what's going on with Jonah. He's twisting Scripture. He sees what God says, but he refuses to believe that that applies to the Ninevites. And that's, that's really bad when you stop and think. Stop and think about this. We accommodate our own lives with things that we won't put on anybody else. I mean, look at, look at, because this is where this is all going to head to. What all has God forgiven you of? Think back about the worst sins in your own life. He's forgiven you. And yet people who have done much less things, we have a hard time forgiving them for whatever the reasons may be. 
So what Jonah was saying, in effect, was, I can understand how God loves me. I'm a Jew. God loves Jews. I'm a prophet. God loves prophets. I've lived a good life. So God loves people to live a good life. But how in the world could God love them? You know anybody like that? Come on, I want you to stop and think about this because you could be freed tonight. You really could. There should be no one that comes to your mind that you don't believe can fit this. Maybe they're a person that's blinded to themselves, but the fact of the matter is they can be forgiven themselves. Well, we could go on and on and on with that, and we need to uh, move on so that we can get the rest of this in and get to chapter 3. Sometimes we get the idea that God only loves people that are like us, and we, we don't need to have that. I want you to look at verse 2 once again in chapter 4. If you know the story of Daniel, or excuse me, of Jonah, really it's all about some things like this. Now listen carefully what I'm going to say. God is a God of love. God is a God of love. He's a God of love for you. He's a God of love for me. He's a God of love for homosexuals. He's a God of love for murderers. He's a God of love, period. And he prefers mercy over wrath. He prefers forgiveness over punishment. He prefers grace over judgment. Why? Because God loves everybody, even the Ninevites. He loves you. That will give you some consolation in your own life and give you some real happiness there too. Let's move on to, chap- to the second uh, point that we're going to be dealing with here. The poor perspective of provision. I'm not going to spend much time there, but here's the bottom line. After Jonah has the great revival and 120,000 people are saved, instead of believing that God's going to spare them like God said he was going to do, he goes way out. This is in modern-day Iraq, 120 degrees out. And he's in modern-day Iraq, and he goes a a distance away from the city, probably a couple miles. He's sitting on this maybe kind of like what um, uh, when he shows that up there, when Jonah's up there, he's sitting out underneath this plant. Well, the plant wasn't there very long. But this plant grew for Jonah while he was sitting out there. And what was he doing when he was sitting out there? The people had repented. He was waiting for the fire of God to come down from heaven to destroy the entire city. Never did happen. Why didn't it happen? Because they repented. That's how God is. So let me pick this up starting in verse 5 of Jonah chapter 4. Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth, a place to sit down. And he sat under it in the shadow, till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Now here's the... Here is the identifying principle that applies to both sides, Nineveh and Jonah. The Ninevites did not deserve the mercy of God. And right here we're seeing that this pouting prophet, he doesn't deserve the grace that God bestowed upon him by causing this plant to grow up and have a gigantic leaf that would stop the sun from beating on his head. The truth of the matter is that all he deserved was a sunburn, but he didn't get what he deserved. Stay with me on this. God doesn't want to give people what they deserve. He wants to give them what they don't deserve. It's really important. Jonah never even bothered to ask where the miraculous plant came from. He just looked at the plant and said, man, that's that's great that it's come here. And we do the same thing when we're extremely happy because God gives good things to us. And as you're about to see, some amazing things can happen when God decides he's going to wake us up. He was not grateful for the gift. Excuse me, he was grateful for the gift, but not grateful for the giver. He never even thought about what he was receiving was from God. And so he didn't even give him any kind of gratitude. Jonah chapter 4, verse 7. But God prepared a worm. Now he's given him the plant. The plant has covered his head all day long. And now God prepares a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die. 
and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Are you doing well to be angry even unto death? And then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Now let's bring this home to ourselves. Because what we're looking at here is God's reminding him, What you've got in your life I gave to you. And you're not even given consideration to that. And the application is very plain. When I, when I did preach on this, I spent an entire message on this because we all are guilty of this. What have you got in your life now? Are you giving yourself credit for all of it? You're the guy that's worked hard. You're a self-made man. Listen, there's a lot of good people in the world that have worked as hard as you have and maybe harder and they don't have anywhere near what you've got. God decides those things himself. He will bless the labor of our hands or he may not bless the labor of our hands. But we need to understand that whatever we have, God has given it to us. And we need to be grateful to God for His grace, for His love, for His mercy, for His forgiveness, for His compassion. And the reason we're grateful is because we don't deserve it. Not one of us deserves what He's given to us. Now we're finally getting to this third point. We're going to look at verse 11. Keep in mind, God wants all people to be saved. This, this is contrast that I'm giving you. God wants everybody to be saved. Jonah only wants people like him to be saved. You see the difference? He was a spiritual racist. That's what he was, basically. God wanted all people to be saved. Jonah only wanted those to be saved who deserved to be saved. Well, stop and think about that. I had a really good conversation with my sister Shirley. Pray for them if you don't mind. Um, she's been in the hospital for 18 days and has come very close to dying a lot of complications. And my brother-in-law, were it not for a miracle drug that's come into existence, would be dead right now. But he's, uh, he's alive too. And uh, he's not open to my witness. My sister seems to be, little peaks of it here and there. We talked about my sister Ruby, and I was telling her that I've called everybody I know to call. I probably gave out uh, a week ago 12 phone calls, maybe two weeks ago to all of the kids that could be related to her. Um, too many of them were just alike in what the research that I did, and so I just started calling every number that I could call. I never got one live voice from anybody in all of those calls. But I, I left messages, let them know that I just wanted to see my sister, just wanted to talk to her, just know whether she's dead or alive. I haven't seen her for close to 50 years now. I haven't gotten one phone call yet. Letters that have been sent have come back, returned to sender. Either she doesn't want to meet anybody in our family or talk to anybody in our family, or she's dead one, but I can't find any death records. Can't find any marriage records on her. Can't find any birth records on her. Can't find anything about her. So you might want to be uh, praying for her and praying for my sister and my brother-in-law. Pray more for their salvation than anything else. And I'll tell you how I've begun to pray. Kelly, who is my oldest nephew, my sister's oldest son, uh, he's married a girl. Her name is Mary. And Mary, when we were out there, we met her. She's a committed, dedicated Christian. She really is. I uh, pulled us aside and said, I, I don't know if Kelly's saved or not, but I know he's well on his way to really receiving Christ as a Savior. A lot of things he doesn't understand, but I'm doing my best to work with that. And, and she is a living testament to them. And it may very well be that she'll, God will use her to reach into their life and bring them to a place where they'll be saved uh, also. That would be great if that was the case. Help me in, in praying about that. Verse 11, we're going to close the book of Jonah with a question. The question never does get an answer. There's a reason why. Did you know there's only two books in the Bible that end with a question? One of them is right here with Jonah. The other is the minor prophet Nahum. And here's what it says. And should not I spare Nineveh, as God speaking, should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? You never find in here that Jonah ever answers that question, and I think I know why. Jonah doesn't answer the question because he knows what the answer is. Look at it again. He says, wherein is more than six score thousand people, that's 120,000 people, that cannot... These are people that are so lost, they cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. 
That's just a, that's a cliche that he's using to say they don't know right from wrong. They don't even know right from wrong. I, I used this young lady that um, kind of poked her nose into our life, and we got to talk with her just a little bit. That I could see with this girl. She wasn't one bit of shame she was living with a guy. That's, that's norm today. I'm just living with this guy. He's a nice guy. He's a really nice guy. And um, that's how the world is today. They, they don't really have the right answers of things, and they don't see what the Bible really does teach. Here's what God said in effect to Jonah. You're so concerned that people of Nineveh are not getting what they deserve that you've forgotten that you also didn't get what you deserve. You read it again. God says, you are so concerned that the people of Nineveh are not getting what they deserve. Have you forgotten? You haven't gotten what you deserve either. It's all of us. Every one of us. Now let me tell you the major difference between the God that you and I serve and the God that every other person in the world serves. This is very simple. Go to any gods that you want that are worshipped by people. There's one vast difference between our God and their God. Our God saves. Their God doesn't. Our God extends mercy. Their God doesn't. On and on his attributes would go with that. It's true that Nineveh didn't get what they deserved. but It's a lesson that God wants to teach Jonah and he wants to teach us too. And I don't mind telling you... Um, well, you already know this. Sometimes uh, we don't see this as clearly as we all see it. God doesn't want anyone to get what they deserve. If you don't walk out of here with anything else, walk out with that. Book of Jonah is teaching us one very simple principle. God doesn't want anyone to get what they deserve. Now, you might be like I am. I guess we all get like this from time to time. Uh, did you hear what's happened, Danny? Was it Supreme Court that ruled in, about the homosexuals that we have to accept their marriages outside of the state? Was that here in this state? Just a federal judge ruled that. Forcing it on us in one way or another. All you've got to do is get on Fox News or whatever you like to get on and just read, and you'll be disgusted with what you see. It's, it's there. Jeremy and I have talked about that time and time again. Why didn't God do something about it? Why didn't God just bring destruction and put an end to all this? You ever thought that yourself? I have. Well, I'm going to give you the answer to that. Two scriptures will suffice. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. It's a memory verse for this week. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. Here it is. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen to this, 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. You see the answer very clearly there. God Delays is coming because he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. I'll wait a little longer. I'll wait a little longer. Maybe that church will wake up. Maybe Bible Baptist will wake up. Maybe that preacher will wake up. Maybe he'll come to the realization that Jonah came to, that I love people. And people need our help. We need to show them that they're loved by him. And no matter what you've done, he'll give you what you don't deserve, which is salvation. And so sometimes we get caught up in things that they're so mundane. I, I, I'm so guilty of this. Scott, as we sat there and ate at the Cracker Barrel and that young lady came over, we were kind of laughing to ourselves and pretty much out loud. She'd just jump right in and join the conversation and getting to the point of even being a little bit irritable. And one of the head waitresses came over and said, you know, you need to be over here doing this or doing this. She was talking to us the entire time. And I sat there knowing what I was going to preach because I know this stuff. I'm getting a little bit aggravated with this girl. And it hit me. I haven't asked her if she's saved. I don't know anything about her. Don't know anything about her life. 
God started speaking in my heart while I'm sitting there. This girl, and all she's trying to do is be friendly. That's all she was trying to do. I don't know if she was trying to build up a tip. I gave her a good tip, but here she was. And I am more concerned about her leaving us alone so we could talk than I was about her own soul. Maybe that's easy for me to confess to you because you've done the very same thing you have. You know, we were at the Mexican restaurant eating, and you know how... Um, forgot his name. Say it loud. Julian. Yeah, don't tell him I did that. Julian. And uh, it was just this past week. I've talked to Julian a lot of times, but I've never really witnessed to him until this last time. I said, do you take off on Sundays at all? No, no. Wednesday? No, I work. Well, I want you to know, if you will ever take off and come to Bible Baptist Church, everybody in our church, knows, does everybody know him? Well, how many of you know Julian? I may have spoke out of turn. Yeah. I said, our church, you're, you, you're going to be real popular in our church. We want a lot of free meals passed out, too, when you come to our church. And he just laughed. Maybe you, maybe you relate with that. How about you? How about you? I want to read something to you that really touched my heart. And it really puts things into perspective because what this is really talking about is people are more important than things. All people are more important than things. The worst of people are more important than things. Remember the scripture? If a man loses his own soul, what shall he gain? If, if a man loses his own soul, he's, he's lost everything. Everything. Nothing's more important than his soul. Okay, listen to this. 20 years ago, the Associated Press ran a story about a young man by the name of Ramon Dunn Jr. He had just turned 16 years of age. They ran a story about his birthday party because he didn't celebrate with cake, because he's allergic to that. He celebrated by eating some bland brown infant formula made by the, burger, by the Gerber Baby Food Company. And the reason he does that is because he suffers from a rare disease. It's the only food that he can keep down and is the food that keeps him alive. Gerber decided to drop that product five years earlier. And Ramon's mother could not find anyone who made this food, and she could not create it herself. She found every can she could, and she was about to run out. So she contacted the Gerber baby food company, whose creed is, babies are our business, to make more of this food. Now listen to what the company did. The company's research director finally consented and volunteers in the research division, volunteers after and above work, and the research division put their own projects on hold, hauled out old equipment, and devoted 7,000 square feet and several days of production space and time just to manufacture food for Raymond Dunn. With only 24 cans of food left, they gave him a two-year supply free of charge, came courtesy of the Gerber... Gerber Baby Food Company. Now, here's a question. Why were they willing to lose all that money just for one kid to give him what they were giving? I think it's obvious. They care more about people than they do money. Think about that. You remember how I started this message and I gave you, that's, that's a penetrating illustration. Remember I gave you the illustration of David Sharp, 34-year-old engineer, sitting on uh, top of Mount Everest, or he wasn't at the top yet. He was getting close to being at the top. And he's sitting on the side of the trail, arms folded and his legs folded, and he obviously is freezing to death. He's going to die. He's in deep trouble. And 40 people, 40 people walk right by him. They saw him. They knew he was going to die. They knew that he needed their help desperately. But they were more concerned with getting to the top of Mount Everest than helping one person. And that would be disgusting to us, except you and I do it every day. Come on, here's what I, here's what I want to end with and what I'd really like you to do if you let God do this for you. Who are you walking by every day? Who? Mine was a waitress last night that I was walking by. It's a little bit different, but I just made my mind up, Faye, that I'm going to need to go down and see Mary Alice. I got to thinking she, she knew Monty. That was her neighbor. And I went down to talk to her about the service 
about how things went. She's the sweetest lady, sweetest lady. Who are you walking by? Who is her face that comes to your mind? A name? A situation that comes to your mind? I hope so, because God doesn't want us to be like Jonah. He wants us to understand how much he loves people. And he wants us to love him also. Let's bow together for just a moment. Joe, do you mind doing this tonight? Father, we know what your word teaches. I'm afraid at times we are guilty, myself included, that we skew things. We let the scripture say what it's not really saying. We don't want to do that, Lord. We want to love people just like you love them. We don't want to walk past the David Sharps in life that are desperate and need us. Help us to speak out. Help us to at least look and see whether you're working in that person's life or not. And I pray that through that, Father, we'll see people that will come to you because we'll be able to give them a great message that God doesn't want to give you what you deserve. He'd like to give to you what you don't deserve. And that's salvation. Can't be earned. It's freely given. Freely given. Give us the grace to do that. And Father, as I'm praying, I want you to speak to each of us here tonight, not just about people and the importance of them to you, but if there's one here tonight that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, Father, speak to them and give them the grace to stand up, make their way down the aisle, and let me know that they've trusted Jesus right here in this service tonight. It's in his name I pray. Keep praying if you don't mind for just a moment. And I'll just stand here for a few moments just in case somebody's here that needs to be saved and would like to be saved tonight. We're waiting for you. We'd love for you to be saved tonight. Just stand to your feet, make your way down the aisle. I'll see you and I'll help you, anyone at all. All right, thank you.